So my first comment today is a legal comment. I have to inform you we will uh, record this session. And uh, after this uh, talk, you will be able to um, have a look uh, on this uh, presentation in the Internet. Okay, <clears throat> maybe we start now. Step by step, a few people are still coming in, logging in. But uh, let's start, I think. So welcome to our today's uh, AU Tech Talk web webinar. Uh, today's presenter is Alexander Ma. Alexander is a senior applications engineer at MKS Instruments in Munich. It's besides all uh, vacuum, uh, pressure and flow related topics, he's all, uh, he also has his focus on gas analysis, for example. So in case you have any questions, feel free also to get in uh, contact with Alexander. The topic of the talk today is vacuum pressure control for critical processes. Alexander, please. Yeah, uh, thank you Bruno for the introduction and thank you for, for joining uh, our uh, tech talk today. Uh, we talk uh, today about uh, pressure control. The last time we, uh, my colleague uh, Markus Schott talked about uh, how to measure the pressure. Today we want to talk about how to control the pressure. Um, our program today uh, would be uh, we start with the upstream pressure control systems and go through possible equipment for them. Then I will talk a little bit about the PID control, followed by some uh, application examples, and we will end with uh, an example of an integrated pressure controller. And then in the second part, we will focus on uh, downstream control. I will show you the MKS smart valves and talk about the model pressure control versus PID control. And then we will look uh, at the components of the valve and discuss as a special component uh, the, the flapper options. And finally, we have a look on the challenges we have with valves like depositions or hot gas. Um, MKS serves several markets. Traditionally, MKS has been strong in the semiconductor industry, which requires most of our equipment. But we also support the industrial market, such as advanced electronic manufacturing uh, and process industry, as uh, the life and health science market and research and defense. Um, an example of pressure control in the industrial market is thin film coating, which is very similar to semiconductor processes from the requirements. Um, for life and health science, I have maybe one example, which is uh, the, the, the production of plastic tubing. Uh, here we control the pressure uh, with the pressure, the inner diameter of the tubing directly on an extruder. Um, but we also used in, in research uh, application. Uh, one I have sold some years ago was uh, for the Max Planck Institute in Garching. Uh, they had uh, set up a, an experiment which was sent to space to do a, some zero gravity in uh, experiments with, with a pressure controller. On the next slide, you will see um, how the product range of MKS has developed over the time. So it's very fast, so I could not go through step by step, but uh, I think you see how we uh, developed. Uh, 
So on the on the right side, you see um, the, the, the solutions we have for uh, around the process chamber, uh, which uh, is mainly uh, done by the VNA products. Um, VNA is uh, the division of vacuum and analysis, which I belong to. And on uh, yeah, on the left side, on, on the right side, you see um, um, yeah, the, the, the instruments we provide around the workpiece, which in this case are mainly uh, L&M uh, division products. L&M is for light and motion, so these division is taking care of lasers and all the optical things you could imagine, like grids, uh, mirrors, lenses, uh, but also the, the instruments to have some very small movements and uh, very stable setups uh, uh, for, for the experiments. Um, to go more in detail uh, regarding the vacuum analyze uh, products, we have the pressure and vacuum measurements from this direct and indirect gauges. Um, also heater traps, effluent management. Um, we provide mass flow controllers uh, in situ flow verifiers, uh, and we could also provide instruments to deliver vapor to, to the process. And what we are talking today um, about valves and pressure controllers, but we also have isolation valves uh, in different uh, ways. Then there is a power and reactive group, um, which are RF generators, um, matching networks, microwave uh, sources uh, to create plasma, but also to provide heat. Um, we also uh, uh, provide instruments for reactive gas, so we could deliver ozone or dissolved CO2 or dissolved ozone in, in, in water. And uh, we have remote plasma sources uh, which are used for chamber cleaning with, with fluorine or in processes for with, with uh, activated oxygen, for example. And uh, something I also take more, uh, I work a little bit more with, uh, with is uh, the analytical part. So we do gas analysis with mass spectrometer, which is something which is working very good in, in vacuum. But we do this also at atmospheric pressure. And uh, we also have infrared uh, detectors uh, and FTIR or tunable filter systems to analyze the gas composition at atmospheric pressure. So we start with the upstream control. Um, yeah, this is an, an example or a very simple schematic of a process chamber. Uh, the blue is the process gas on uh, so the direction of the arrow is uh, the way to the pump. And on the top, we have a pressure transducer, which provides uh, the pressure signal to a pressure controller. And this pressure controller will compare the pressure signal with a set point and creates out of this an, a control signal to a valve, or in this case, to a mass flow controller control unit and uh, this mass flow controller control unit then adjusts the flow depending on the control signal given from 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 the con pressure controller to increase the flow or to decrease the flow depending on what is required for getting the right pressure um, this is a one hand it's a uh, very uh, attractive solution because you do not need any extra parts uh, besides the pressure controller. Normally you have already the mass flow controller in place, also the pressure sensor, so you only add an, 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 yeah, a control unit. Um, the other thing which is uh, very helpful very often is that there's the, the valves itself are not in contact with the process, so they, the mass flow controller only deal with, deals with, with a pure gas. And uh, so you do not have to think about uh, reaction products, uh, which could maybe affect your, your valve. The downside is that you give up control of the total flow. So you could set up a ratio control, which means that all 
the composition of all gases injected to the process uh, will, will be not changed, but we need to to change the, the total flow to adjust the pressure. So you 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 have uh, one parameter less to optimize your process, and uh, depending on on the size of the substrate and and, and the, the geometry of of your process, this could lead to inhomogeneity of the deposition. Um, what what kind of solutions could we offer for for upstream control? So the most flexible set would be uh, so uh, a valve, electromagnetic valve, a pressure sensor. You need a pressure sensor in general, and then a controller which operates the pressure sensor, which does the comparison between set point and signal and creates a control signal and uh, provide then the right signal to the control valve. Or with the 946, you could use instead of the control valve also mass flow controller or a set of mass flow controllers. So it's very flexible and you could yeah, exchange uh, single components uh, if, if you change your maybe your chamber or your process. Another very smart solution is uh, to use a mass flow controller plus a pressure sensor. So you could um, overwrite the, the flow signal inside of the mass flow controller with a pressure signal from an external pressure sensor. So that at the end, the mass flow controller is operated as a pressure controller. Um, you still will get the, the flow signal, so it's a very cost effective solution, but it is limited to a single gas. And yeah, because of we are always asked to make it more compact and uh, less connection because every connection could be uh, cause an, an, an issue. Uh, we uh, designed uh, an integrated solution, which uh, is this part here below, which is very similar to a mass flow controller. Um, so if it's only a pressure controller, then it has the same size, the same dimensions, and is uh, also the interface is very similar to, to a mass flow controller. It contains the pressure sensor, the control valve, the controller, and as an option, you could get this also with, with an integrated mass flow meter. Good thing is that we also uh, use switches for the PID uh, values so that if you have similar chambers, uh, you could copy the control values from tool to tool um, uh, because these are switches and you could yeah, copy this directly. Now we talk a little bit about the PID controller. PID is named after the three correction, correcting terms. P stands for the proportional term, which is taking account the present error between uh, the signal and the set point. So it's really looking at the present. Um, then we have the integral term, which is um, uh, integrating the, the, the deviation uh, between signal and set point over the time. So it's looking in the in the past. Um, and then we have the derivative term, um, which uh, looks a little bit in the, into the future because it looks it sees how the error signal will develop due to the slope, uh, and you could apply then correction for that. Most of the time, the D term is not adjustable, so many, very often you have only a PI controller and the D term is fixed in the system because if you have three terms to optimize, it could be, uh, yeah, could be a very complicated thing. So that's some, so normally one parameter is, is, is fixed in the controllers. Um, some some uh, not, uh, names I, I use in the next slides um, uh, for the error signal, the function E of T, the difference between set point and reading, and the control signal as CS, so which is a signal to control the position of the valve. 
the contribution of the proportional term to the control signal is given by the product of P uh, with uh, the error signal. Um, in the graph, you see uh, the pressure signal plotted against the time. Um, and I show here some extreme examples uh, of the proportional term effect. Um, the red one is if I select a two high value for, for the P term. And the green one is if P is set too small. And the gray one or black one here uh, is uh, the, supposed to be uh, represent an idle curve. And the dotted line is the set point. If, it set, uh, if you set P too, uh, too high, it will overreact. So uh, it will overshoot. And again, you have an error signal, and it will overreact again and uh, overshoot in the other direction of the set point. And uh, yeah, if it's really high, you will get an oscillation. So it will really oscillate because every time it overshoots, it creates an overshoot in the, in the other direction. If it's too, too small, you will get a, a slow response. Um, but yeah, that's difficult to, uh, to say, okay, it's optimum or not, because yeah, you will see a lot of cur curves here in between. If you go to higher and at some point it will maybe start to oscillate. Um, yeah, the so integral term, um, the control signal is generated out of the integral value multiplied by the integral integral uh, of uh, the error function, the uh, error, yeah, error function. Um, if you select this value too high, it will overreact after a very short time, so you get an overshoot, and uh, it could be also react, uh, happens during the, the more or less stable pressure because of a small deviation, you will get also a very uh, strong correction. The purpose of the I, uh, I term is to avoid a small remaining uh, error signal. So the P uh, term will not correct this because it's happy if, if everything is in, uh, I would say, in, in balance, but the small deviation would not uh, cause any correction by the P term. So that's the reason for the integral term. So over the time, it integrates the area below uh, this green curve uh, between set point and the green curve and gives then a correction to make this deviation to zero. If it's too small, you will have deviations, small deviations for longer time. Yeah, the der derivative term, um, uh, yeah, it's in the case of an overreaction, a steep slope becomes, becomes a horizontal curve. So start here and then it overreacts and yeah, more or less uh, makes this a slope to, to, to zero, uh, horizontal um, curve, and then the D term is, is zero. And uh, again, the, f so the, the process will start again with, with, a, with, a, with a, s a steep slope and it overreacts again. So it you could end up with, with a step uh, stepwise curve. If it's too small, uh, the D term would be not able to avoid uh, an overshooting, so it uh, you, you, the slope is not damped enough to to avoid this this uh, overshooting. Um, yeah, here's an example uh, for upstream pressure control. Uh, it's called wafer backside cooling. Um, you see here this, that's our wafer in the process chamber. And uh, yeah, the wafer is held by uh, on the chuck with electrostatic forces. And uh, on the back side, there is an helium atmosphere applied. Um, and the helium atoms, because they are very light and, and, and because of that very fast, give us a very good heat transfer from the wafer uh, to the walls, so we could remove heat, which is 
um, introduced by the process very fast from, from the wafer. Um, if the pressure would be too low, then we have not uh, enough helium uh, atoms to, to remove the heat. And if the pressure would be too, too high, we would maybe blow, uh, blow the wafer into the process chamber and, and it's end of process. So, uh, so a tight control with over, without overshoot uh, shooting is required here. Additionally, uh, the helium flow is measured to check that the wafer is still in position and that there is no le helium leaking into the process chamber. Um, as you could see, there's always um, a needle valve or orifice at the end so that there is guaranteed that there is a, uh, a, a flow always uh, um, uh, in the system because all of the controllers we are discussing today uh, are dynamic controllers, so they require a, a flow. Uh, so you could not fill chambers or something like, uh, like this uh, with our controllers. Um, again, you see here the optimization by an integrated controller. In the past, you used a master controller with a capacitance manometer like a Baratron and a controller which control sends a master controller to adjust uh, the pressure yeah, below the wafer. Today we offer a, a single instrument which contains a baritron control valve and the flow meter in, in one box and with only two fittings. Another application for the integrated controller is a back pressure control. Um, of a bubbler where you try to get uh, uh, yeah out of the vapor pressure as a, so, as a, uh, so you add to the what's the incoming gas with, with the vapor pressure of, of this uh, material which is in the bubbler and to get a very constant uh, um, a precursor concentration uh, it's good to have always the same pressure in, in the bubbler um, obviously, this is already a downstream control, no longer an, an, an upstream control because the controller for the pressure sits here between the bubbler and the chamber, so it controls the pressure um, downstream of the bubbler. Yeah, let's have a look into the, the, the an example of an integrated pressure controller. Um, you see, it's the inlet. Um, there is a typical bypass and the flow, pa uh, flow meter pass for measuring the flow, and then followed by uh, the electromagnetic control valve, and at the end, uh, a baritron for measuring the, the pressure. And then you have the control electronics, which uh, do the control for the valve to, to get the right pressure uh, out of this control. If you, uh, there are also options without the flow meter and then you could use the instrument in both directions. So you could uh, also change outlet to inlet and uh, do upstream or downstream control with the same instrument only by ch changing some, some uh, dip switches. <laughs> Okay, then we are already in the second part. Um, now we are talking about downstream control. Uh, again, we start with uh, our simplified process chamber where we have the process gas, the way to the pump. We have again our pressure controller. We have our controller for the master controllers and the set of master controllers. And additionally, we have here a valve downstream or in between the chamber and the pump, which change the conductance um, or the effective conduct, uh, pump speed uh, at the process chamber. So the pressure signal is sent to the pressure controller compared with the set point, and then it generates a control signal to change the position of this valve. And uh, you see now we could adjust the pressure without 
uh, changing the total flow of uh, the gas mixtures injected to the chamber. So we have one parameter more to optimize our critical process, and uh, that's very often required. Uh, in semiconductor, there are some, some three main approaches to control the pressure in, in vacuum. One would be to control the blower speed or the pump speed. Um, it has a, it only has a very low uh, dynamic range, and not all pumps pro, uh, support this kind of control. The speed of response, because pumps are very often very large uh, uh, systems, is moderate, so speed could not be changed very fast. Um, initial capital cost, maybe you need an extra controller for doing this. Um, during operation, no extra cost, and uh, your pump should be able to uh, take care of the process gases anyway, so there's no extra uh, regarding uh, the process gases. Um, but you have to size everything very correct correctly to, to uh, get the control range you, you need. Another uh, solution would be gas ballast. So you inject extra gas uh, uh, below the chamber in, into the pump uh, system. So you reduce the effective pump speed at the chamber entrance because you put extra load of gas into the pump. Um, so the, the, the dynamic range is yeah 500 to one or 1000 to one maximum. Uh, it's still it's very fast, um, but you need some maybe some bypass valve and optional controller, um, and everything has to be uh, sized properly. And what we are talking today is downstream control with a throttle valve. Uh, we have the highest dynamic range, so up to 10,000 to one. It works with every pump. It is fast. You have to invest in an exhaust valve and controller. There are no operating costs. Um, yeah, if you have deposition, it could happen to your valve as well, so it has some uh, effect, uh, but there are no other special requirements. So our latest uh, or current uh, offer for throttling valves um, are smart valves, which uh, includes the, the controller already. So there is no need to have an extra electronic. Um, you could, for both types, I have shown uh, presented here the T, T, uh, T3B and the T2B. Um, uh, you could select between a high torque or high speed version. High speed means that uh, open to close is uh, faster than 200 milliseconds. Uh, both instruments could support two baritron or two capacitance manometer to increase uh, the, the, the range. Um, we have low conductance versions and uh, both uh, offers an advanced model-based pressure control algorithm in, uh, as an option where you could select between PID and this uh, model-based correction. Um, the difference between 3TB and uh, uh, the T2B is uh, the interfaces. So the T3B is uh, available with analog interface RS232 or DeviceNet. The other one is with EtherCAT RS232, RS485. And additionally, it comes with an LCD touchscreen display where you could see the position of the valve and, and, and uh, other information. And uh, yeah, we also have uh, another uh, low conductance um, solution, which is called Q Cup, uh, which is uh, improved F Cup version for, for harsh processes. Um, yeah, model-based pressure control, what does this mean or why do we do this? Um, if the, uh, in upstream control, you keep the con uh, conductance uh, of the system constant and only the flow is uh, it's changed. 
So the system becomes linear and in a simple PID can be designed and perfectly tuned. If you change the conductance uh, or you control with the, con uh, with the conductance, uh, the pressure, um, then it will be highly nonlinear because uh, the conductance of a pump is not constant over the complete range. So it will be difficult to, to find PID parameters, which uh, covers all uh, areas of, of uh, or so the whole range of the pressure. Um, so we have models where you could put in up to five PID uh, sets uh, for, for operating at different pressures. So you could change, say uh, you have a high pressure with set A, and you have a medium pressure with set B, but it's it's really limited to uh, uh, yeah five, five sets of uh, PID parameters. Um, so the model-based control allows to have a, a solution and, or good control over the whole range. Um, therefore, the instrument is learning how the system from uh, reacts under normal uh, or, or process conditions regarding uh, yeah pump speed, uh, effective pump speed over the, the, the range. You also have to add the volume of the chamber to, to make this model more stable. Uh, yeah, in this graph, you could uh, see the comparison between uh, a conventional uh, control and uh, this uh, um, model-based control. So the green and red one is um, the conventional control. So the red one is the pressure and the green one is the position of the valve. And uh, here it's shown uh, with um, this T3B. Uh, the blue one is the position of the valve and uh, Yes, it's yellow, it should be yellow. A yellow curve is, is uh, representing the pressure. So it's much faster. Uh, it reaches uh, the, the set point uh, compared to, to the PID controller. The ex example is based on a chamber with five liter volume, 200 SSM flow and a two inch valve. <clears throat> Yeah, let's look into such a valve. Um, on the top, we have the interface board. So depending on what kind of interface you, are, you need for your PLC, you have different boards uh, for selecting. So device net, EtherCAD, analog or RS485. Then we have a control board where the pressure control is done. We have the motor drive, uh, electronics and then we have an optical encoder which uh, provides us uh, feedback of the flapper position and then we have a stepper motor which uh, uh, moves the flapper it could be optional uh, um, with, with a gearbox to increase the torque uh, and the resolution Very interesting of these parts is uh, the flapper because the flapper is uh, yeah, exposed to the process. So one solution would be the non-sealing version so that there's really only the metal flapper with a uh, large gap between uh, when, the, when the valve is closed. It's very inexpensive. It will have a long life because there's no elastomer which could be wear off and uh, it allows fast movement because there is no friction. Uh, an improvement for us is the F cup which is not a solid O-ring, so it's, it's a structure which allows us uh, to, to um, get less friction um, uh, so we could um, uh, use this for high speed valves and with direct drive, so not extremely high torque is required. Um, it will have a long life. Um, 
it's PTFE based, so it is also uh, uh, good for most of the process gases. And due to this um, uh, uh, better sealing, um, you could also control in a wider range uh, up to high pressure, which is impossible with the non-sealing version where you have, you see it here, uh, already a limitation of one or two. In this example, it's a two, 20 liter chamber with five SLM uh, input flow. So <clears throat> with the F-seal, you could go to higher pressures to, um, due to a much smaller gap. Um, the Q-cap uh, have in um, principle the same advantages as the F-cap, but it is uh, better in in uh, very harsh processes because it uh, uh, could a little bit, uh, would say, remove the, the, the depositions. Yeah, now we come uh, to the last section where we talk about uh, the challenges we have. One of, uh, would say, the main challenges is uh, are the depositions on the valve. If you are working in the uh, semiconductor industry, you, very often you have to, to handle CVD processes. So uh, here's an example of uh, MOCVD for gallium nitride deposition. You have this black coating. Uh, or epitaxy process where you have a honey-like uh, deposition. But yeah, for every CVD or ALD process, you have a lot of different kinds in every color uh, deposition. So what could we do to improve that? First of it, it would be idle to, to avoid any deposition. And uh, this could very often done by uh, increasing the heat so that there is no condensation on, on the flapper. That's the reason why we offer uh, heated versions. Um, yeah, also some time ago, we already had a presentation by Kevin Grout about the heaters. And uh, yeah, so we could heat up these valves for, uh, up to 150 degrees to minimize uh, the, the condensation. But we also have different solutions, which like traps or a virtual wall, which provides uh, an inert gas uh, flow at the wall uh, to to keep the process gases in the middle and and, and reduce uh, the condensation. Um, for sure, if you have deposition, it makes sense to have a higher torque. So then you maybe select the option with the gearbox. Um, which means you reduce a little bit the speed because uh, of, of this gearbox. And yeah, uh, the, the, the mentioned seals like F cup and Q cup are recommended for, for these kind of processes. And if it's possible, you could also use larger gaps between flapper and body to avoid that uh, there is some, some blockage caused by, by the deposition. Yeah, uh, another problem could be um, that uh, the process generates uh, heat and this heat could uh, also cause that uh, flapper uh, will be heat heated. Um, uh, but it could be also that uh, if you have a chamber clean to remove the deposition of the uh, of the deposition uh, step. That this could cause an, an, an reaction on the surface on the flapper, which also generate heat. And if it's uh, the temperature increased on on, on the flapper, uh, it will expand. Uh, so the gap between uh, the body and the flapper will become smaller. So. You could also select different gaps to adjust uh, or to get the optimum for, for your process temperatures uh, um, for operating this, this valve. So that's the end of my talk today. If any questions, please be free to um, yeah, speak directly or use the chat function. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, at the end, some numbers uh, about MKS if you're interested. 
Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. A real nice and interesting talk with a lot of information inside. Great. Do we have some questions already? Maybe I will start with uh, one question. You just before you talked about the gaps between flapper and the body, which can be modified a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> is my understanding correct there that uh, it's not uh, when it's closed, it's not 100% closed. So uh, in principle, there's always a need for an additional shut off valve when it uh, needs to be closed. Uh, yes and no. Um, we, the, the current uh, valves we, we offer, the T2B and the T3B, um, are not leak tight valves. Um, so they have a leak rate of up to 1000 SCCM uh, or below 1000 SCCM. Um, uh, if if you select the the F cup or the Q cup, yes. Um, if if it's without uh, any seal, then it's uh, a, a larger uh, yes, flow, okay. maybe some 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 liters. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also had in the past, or yeah, we, we still offer these units um, instruments uh, of yeah valves with an O ring which really close, but the leak rate is still one times to 10, 10 to minus seven millibar liter per second. So, so, I, so either I will need a mass flow controller to, uh, to give enough uh, gas inside, or I need a shut off valve just to be able to open a chamber when it's under vacuum, correct? Yeah, but normally uh, you will have maybe a shut off valve anyway to, to remove parts for example, the, the throttle valve to, to keep your chamber still on the vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, may, maybe you should take into account if you have very large uh, diameters for, for the, for the uh, pump line, uh, that uh, the flapper itself requires a lot of space when it's completely open. So for mm -hmm. um, NV50 or uh, it's not not an issue, but if you have an, an, uh, NV250, uh, then uh, you have to think about the space which is required above and below the, the throttling valve. Oh, good hint, yeah. Questions from the audience? Okay, maybe I, I have another question. Uh, you presented the model-based pressure control and the PID control. Do we have some preferences? When to use which one? Uh, yeah, in principle, uh, it makes uh, or PID control is absolute uh, sufficient if you do an upstream control because of the linear uh, function uh, or reaction of the system. But for uh, an, a downstream control, uh, it makes sense to use this model-based uh, control because it's very nonlinear. If you're working in a very tight uh, window of pressure, maybe you could adjust this also with PID uh, values um, or with a set of PID uh, values. Um, but uh, life will be much, much be easier and your control will much be better with, with a model-based uh, control. But it requires that you could run a learning uh, with, with a valve uh, under more or less pro process conditions, the right flow, and then see how the system reacts, what is the really effective flow. So that's something uh, you, uh, this you have to do before. Mm -hmm. So from understanding point of view, from handling point of view, when I understand it, I understand it correctly, it's uh, PID is the fastest solution. Just do it and try what you get. When you want to optimize it, maybe let's go. It's better to go for the model based. No, uh, I, I would say uh, it could be uh, a mess to find the optimum parameters for PID if you have all three right. parameters available. Uh, uh, but it could be if your system is in principle uh, already stable, it could be very easy. Uh, but 
if it's a challenge, uh, challenging uh, application, it could be uh, really a mess because with three parameters, you could uh, try a lot of different uh, settings. Mm -hmm. um, and with a model based, you have to do something, uh, but it uh, would say it's the time you have to invest is really defined. So you, you know, if you have run the test procedure, you're done. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. But, but when I see the uh, graphs, uh, when I, in, I still have in mind the graphics, where for example PID, sometimes there's an overshoot, sometimes an undershoot, and when the model base is done in a good way, then I can also prevent over and undershoots. Yes. Uh, with, with an, I uh, would say, optimum PID control, it should be also look a little bit better than uh, for, for sure, shown but... in, in the graph. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you also could see in, in this graph is that uh, to to keep the pressure very stable, and uh, we want to have a very fast valve, which means we do not have a very high resolution. So, in uh, would say with the older valves, we use the resolution of more than twelve thousand steps. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we have, uh, I think, something like 1,000 steps to, to, to control the position. Um, but we see that this is not required to keep the pressure very constant because of the fast controlling and, 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 and the high speed of the valve, you could change a little bit the position to keep the pressure absolutely constant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no need to, to use a gearbox to, to get these. Um, yeah, which makes your valve at the end uh, slower. Okay, thanks a lot. So I've seen no additional questions here. Maybe please feel free just to contact us for questions when they come up in the evening or tomorrow. Doesn't matter. Just uh, contact us and yeah, thanks a lot again. Okay. Next session will be, do you know, Bruno? Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. I don't know the, the next, next webinar session. will be on the 27th of October. 27th of October, yes, okay. Thanks again and have a nice day. Yep, from my side as well. Goodbye.